Hello and welcome back to Oh So Retro and to part 3 of my series on early 3D accelerator cards. The card I have for you today is really interesting in my opinion because as far as I can tell this was one of the very first if not the first GPU for the PC or at least what we would recognize today as a GPU. And for a very brief moment it reigned supreme as the fastest most exciting 3D card the world had ever seen. This card was, as I'm sure you've gathered from the video's description, the rendition Verite. So get yourself a cup of tea and gather round for story time. Founded in 1993 in Mountain View, California, rendition waded into the foray that was the 3D accelerator wars of the mid-1990s with its Verite line of cards. If you aren't familiar with what was happening at the time and why many manufacturers were all trying to be the first to put out a consumer level 3D accelerator, be sure to watch my video on the S3 where I go over a bit of background on the state of 3D accelerators in 1995-1996 and the context in which these early 3D cards were beginning to arise. But suffice to say that by 1996, Intel's Pentium processor had become mainstream and its vastly improved floating point calculation ability and speed opened the door to increasingly complex 3D games for the PC. This, combined with the decreasing price of memory, created the perfect environment for graphics card manufacturers to create dedicated 3D add-in cards for these games. Indeed, at one point there were as many as 56 companies trying to get into the market and provide consumer grade 3D accelerators. While history will remember NVIDIA and ATI as the ultimate winners of that battle, between 1996 and 1999 the story was very different. 3DFX had pretty much dominated the playing field with their Voodoo Graphics chipset whose impressive performance had totally blindsided every other card manufacturer. But there was one other card that could potentially compete with the Voodoo and which actually beat it to the market at least and that was the rendition Verite. Initially revealed in September 1995, the Verite 1000 or V1000 immediately generated a lot of excitement over its purported capabilities and what it could potentially bring to the world of 3D games. More importantly, Rendition had very early support from a bunch of big name developers such as id Software, Looking Glass and Papyrus. Plus, the development of the chip itself was open to developers, allowing them to help guide the design and ensure good real-world performance. The performance that the Verite promised was so good in fact that it caused some of the biggest names in the business to stand up and take notice. Creative Labs, which had entered the 3D accelerator market the year before with their ill-fated 3D Blaster VLB card, quickly dropped the Permedia 3D chip from 3D Labs from their previous generation card and launched the new 3D Blaster PCI using the rendition chipset. Intergraph, a well-known manufacturer of high-end workstations and CAD rigs, had been eyeing the consumer 3D market for quite some time, and when they did finally decide to jump in, they chose the rendition chip to power their card, the Intergraph Reactor. For a company with such a history in high-end 3D systems, this was high praise indeed. Even Sierra chose the rendition chip to launch their new 3D accelerator board, the Screaming 3D. Sierra wasn't usually in the business of producing hardware, but hoping to set a standard in the nascent 3D accelerator market, which pretty much resembled the Wild West at that point with multiple APIs from different manufacturers, Sierra hoped it could use its considerable influence in the industry to push their chosen standard, and to that end they decided to throw their weight behind the rendition Verite chip as their hardware of choice. But, although the market and consumers were more than ready to get their hands on the Verite, things weren't going so well back at Rendition HQ. Rendition had decided to farm out the layout of the chip to the fabricator instead of doing it in-house, which caused the chip to be delayed for months. Even worse, the QA of the chips was of a poor standard, which resulted in chips that were very buggy and difficult to code for. This meant the Verite V1000 was only finally launched in October 1996, just one month before the 3 d effects Voodoo. Had Rendition not had these issues, they would have been able to get the card out much earlier and would have had no real competition for months. 
Also, the design of the chip was pretty innovative for its time. Instead of going for fixed function hardware designed to do one thing and do it well, which is what the 3DFX SGI inspired guys decided to do, Rendition thought the best way forward was to basically build a CPU that could be programmed using what Rendition called microcode, or firmware in today's language, to support new 3D features as they became available. In effect then, the Verite was basically just a slow RISC CPU running at 25 MHz with a few 3D geometry functions bolted on. In hindsight, this is interesting because it made the Verite the first true graphics processing unit, or GPU, for the PC as we would recognize it today. In fact, the API created for Rendition, R Redline for Windows and Speedy 3D for DOS, is very similar to the Vulkan API we use today. The Verite was also designed from the ground up to be compatible with other APIs like Microsoft's Direct3D and it even had good OpenGL support after a while. Also worth noting here is the collaboration between Rendition, Hercules and Fujitsu on the Thriller Conspiracy project which combined a Fujitsu FXG1 Pinolite geometry processor with a Verite V2200 core to create a graphics card with full TNL engine years before NVIDIA's GeForce 256. Unfortunately though, this card never made it to market. One thing that the first rendition chip did lack, however, was any form of hardware accelerated Z buffering. Z, or depth buffering, is basically a technique that allows the computer to determine if a particular pixel is hidden or occluded by another, and then decide if that pixel should be drawn or not. So for example, if there is one object in front of another in a scene, then obviously the pixels from the object behind mustn't be drawn because they are occluded by the object in front. The lack of any hardware acceleration for this process on the Verite chip meant that the CPU had to do this and this oversight would become a major issue for the Verite letter. The Verite also utilized Direct Memory Address, or DMA, to access data in the main system memory without involving the CPU. In theory, this led to a big increase in performance and saved CPU cycles, but in practice, many motherboards, especially early Pentium boards, didn't implement DMA properly, forcing the Verite to fall back to the old first-in, first-out mode, or FIFO, which hampered performance. However, even when the DMA was working, it wasn't all that great, as any improper write to the wrong area in memory would result in a system lockup, necessitating a hard reboot. It wouldn't have been so bad if this was a rare occurrence, but it tended to happen pretty often, which was frustrating to say the least. Another frustrating thing about the Verite was its 2D performance. Unlike 3DFX and PowerVR, which were pure 3D solutions and required the user to have an existing 2D card in their machine, Rendition wanted to offer a single slot graphics solution with both 2D and 3D on the same chip. This was a good idea, but the 2D performance of the Rendition chip left much to be desired. While its SVGA or Visa modes ran quite well and would later be improved upon further by driver updates, the VGA performance was dismal and games such as Doom would run so badly as to be unplayable, even on machines with very fast CPUs. This was definitely no S3 level 2D performance and this oversight caused a lot of resentment from people trying to use their new graphics cards for older DOS games. I guess the people at Rendition thought that nobody would still be playing Doom in 1997. Little did they know that we'd still be playing Doom in 2021. Despite these setbacks and limitations, when the Verite did finally launch, it blew the competition away. While other 3D accelerators of the time could offer increased resolution and texture filtering similar to the Verite, the Verite's image quality and more complete 3D feature set was way ahead of most other cards. It was also miles faster and could boast full rates of 25 megapixels per second, pretty much unheard of on the PC at the time. And while there were quite a few games that supported the Verite at the time of launch, the real jewels in the rendition crown were Quake and Tomb Raider. In late 1996, the two biggest games on the market, and the ones that were on the cover of pretty much every gaming magazine that year, were id Software's Quake and Tomb Raider by Core Design. 
Although very different from a gameplay point of view, both were groundbreakers in that they used full 3D engines. And although they looked decent enough in software rendered mode, both were crying out for hardware acceleration. And the only car that could do a decent job of accelerating these two games initially was their rendition Verite. The release of V-Quake, the Verite version of Quake, in early December 1996 was a major coup for rendition and for a brief period the Verite was the only card to support hardware acceleration for Quake. In much the same way, Tomb Raider looked just like another generic dungeon crawler in software mode but it was a totally different experience in 3D accelerated mode with gorgeous bilinear filtered and mipmap textures all running at much higher resolutions with good speed. Another game where the Verite made a fairly remarkable difference was Descent 2. Software mode was pretty standard for your mid 1990s shooter, but with the Verite patch it transformed Descent into something really impressive. It's pretty much as good as you got with the 3DFX Voodoo as far as I can tell. I'm running this on the later V2100 chip, but performance on the first generation Verite chip would still have been very impressive. Also impressive is Monster Truck Madness 2. The game has a special rendition mode for the Verite and the difference between that and software mode is pretty damn impressive. Not only does it run at a higher resolution and look way better, but it also runs much faster than software, especially in the higher resolution. Other games were far less impressive however. Running NASCAR 2 here on the Verite was a massive disappointment. Although there was a noticeable jump in image quality, the penalty was the frame rate which was pretty much halved when enabling hardware acceleration, which is never a good sign. Even when I turned off virtually all the graphics features, it still seemed to make very little difference, so something is definitely wrong here. Interestingly, IndyCar Racing 2, which was also made by Papyrus and seems to use the same engine as NASCAR 2, seemed to get a big improvement when using the rendition patch. But unfortunately, I wasn't able to get hold of the rendition version of that game, so I couldn't test it. MDK is another game where the effects of the Verite acceleration are quite subtle, with the most noticeable difference being the texture filtering on the floor and walls. Still, the game plays really well in both software and hardware accelerated mode, but if I had to choose, I would probably go for the hardware accelerated mode every time. It just looks a little bit better. But uh, MDK is far less convincing a case for the Verite than Tomb Raider and Descent 2 were. There were quite a few other games which the Verite supported, but I think you get the idea by now. Compared to other early 3D cards like the S3 Verge for example, the Verite was in a league of its own when it came to performance. And for the most part your games would run much quicker and also look way better. As you can probably imagine, this made cards based on the Verite chip find their way to the top of Christmas card wish lists for many many gamers at the time. But the Verite's days were numbered. It might have been the only card that could run Quake with hardware acceleration, but that didn't last long at all. On 2nd January 1997, less than one month after the release of V-Quake, GL Quake was released for the 3DFX Voodoo. While the 25 megapixels per second fill rate of the Verite was impressive at first, it looked decidedly pedestrian compared to the 50 megapixels per second of the Voodoo. Consequently, while the Verite would cruise along at a respectable 25 frames per second in Quake at 640x480, the Voodoo flew past it at 45 frames per second on the same settings and the same hardware. And there were other problems too. The Verite patch for Quake, VQuake, had taken developers from id Software and Rendition a long time to develop. And remember the Rendition's lack of a hardware accelerated V-buffer? Well, that meant that using Quake's inbuilt 3D hardware accelerated renderer was too slow, so instead they had to modify the software renderer to work with the Verite, and then had to offload all of the said buffering work to the CPU instead. This meant the CPU would always be very busy with running VQuake, with the Verite not doing very much at all. It turns out this lack of a hardware accelerated Z buffer would prove to be a fatal flaw for the Verite.
Rendition tried to remedy these issues with the release of their next chip, the V2000 series, but again there were issues with the design and fabrication process and the chip was delayed until late 1997. And even though the new V2000 series chips were now running at 50 MHz, had hardware accelerated Z buffer support and could finally match the performance of the 3DFX Voodoo with full rates of around 50 megapixels per second, it proved to be too little too late. By the time the V2000 cards started to ship, the Voodoo had been out for almost a year and 3DFX's next iteration, the Voodoo 2, was just around the corner. In terms of performance, the new card was certainly better than the V1000 series, but the weird way that the VQuake patch had to be written for the previous generation of cards meant that Quake, and all Quake engine games for that matter, of which there were quite a few at this point, like Hexen 2 for example, were pretty much all CPU bound on the Verite. So the faster V2000 chips saw little to no performance gain in these games. To make matters worse, Rendition had done very little to remedy the instability and poor VGA performance of the previous generation, so that V2000 cards were still just as flawed in that regard. Obviously this didn't exactly send people rushing out to upgrade to the new series of cards. However, the V2000 chips did offer a good price to performance ratio, especially considering it included a 2D core and therefore saved the user the extra cost of an additional 2D card, which was still significant at this point. This meant that they were popular cards with system builders and they did actually sell quite well. By early 1998 however, the Voodoo 2 had arrived and this was the final nail in the Verite's coffin. With its 90 MHz clock speed and fill rates of around 90 megapixels per second, the Voodoo 2 could already manage nearly double the performance of the V2000 chips. Once again, 3DFX had leapfrogged Rendition's card. Rendition was forced to slash pricing to compete and pretty soon the cards could be found for as little as $50, which actually made them extremely good value, especially for gamers on a budget who wanted a combined 2D and 3D graphics card. Rendition tried to play catch up again with its 3 and 4000 series of chips, which certainly looked promising on paper, however by this time the company was struggling to survive, and a buyout by Micron Electronics put paid to these ideas, as Micron were more interested in making integrated graphic solutions, and certainly didn't want to go toe to toe with 3DFX and Nvidia. Both the V3000 and 4000 chips were eventually cancelled in the early 2000s. In many ways then, the story of Rendition is a tragic one. The Verite's innovative design of building a programmable GPU, which has since been proven by Nvidia and ATI to pretty much be the correct way of building a graphics card, was unfortunately plagued by design and fabrication issues, which in turn resulted in the chip being delayed for months, and in the turbulent and fast moving frontier that was the world of 3D graphics cards in the mid 1990s, this delay was devastating. Had Rendition managed to get the card out on time, it would have had the whole market pretty much to itself. There was certainly nothing from the S3 or ATI or any other manufacturer that could realistically compete with the Verite in terms of performance. It probably would have sold really well and could easily have put Rendition on the top of the GPU leaderboard years before Nvidia got there, and provided them the resources to develop better products that could then compete with 3DFX and Nvidia down the line. And, had things turned out differently, the GPU in the computer that you're using to watch this YouTube video may very well have been a rendition instead of an NVIDIA or ATI. Instead, manufacturing delays combined with bad quality assurance, questionable 2D performance and other bad design decisions like lack of a hardware accelerated Z buffer and the use of unstable DMA transfers meant it fell victim pretty easily to the monstrous performance and stability of the Voodoo despite being a single card solution and significantly cheaper. These days, rendition is barely remembered and has become little more than a footnote in the history of computer 3D graphics cards. But it's worth taking a look back at it nonetheless, if only to wonder what might have been for this pioneer of PC GPUs.